uh, going to talk a little bit about scouting field diseases and um, some disease pressure and of course we're going to talk about 360 bullet. Um, the whole idea of today is to be extremely agronomically sound. So um, I'm going to talk about the diseases, talk about management practices, and then talk about how our 360 system is trying to help growers find solutions. So here's today's agenda, disease scouting, insect scouting, um, talk about the bullet. So keep in mind, uh, given my region, we've been extremely dry. Um, I know if there are regions, uh, Matt Foles likes to call me on a daily basis to tell me how great his corn looks in terms of receiving moisture and rainfall in northern uh, Illinois. So I know that there are wet areas out there. Um, my background for this year is pretty dry, so I'll try to do my best to, to cover the whole U.S. to kind of give you a whole regional perspective on, on what we're seeing. Because as we know, scouting for insects, scouting for disease, extremely environmentally impactful. Um, so what perhaps I'm seeing may be different than Nebraska, may be different than Oklahoma and, and Illinois. So uh, let's get into it. Let's, let's start talking about it. So insect scouting. Today I'm going to focus on four insects. Um, well, caveat, maybe not insects, um, that, that we're going to be talking about here. So spider mites in dry areas, uh, specifically here as we move north and east, uh, Japanese beetles, <clears throat> western bean cutworm, and the uh, the all elusive that Jim Swartz found the other day, the red-headed flea beetle. So let's, let's get in and start talking about it. First and foremost, spider mites. So those of you that have received rainfall may not have to worry about this one. Spider mites are typically found where it's extremely hot and dry. So when you guys are taking your 55 mile an hour scouting pass on many of the back roads, you may start to see fields like this. Okay. Typically towards that field edge, you'll start to see yellow or browning. Um, you may be a little bit confused saying, hey, I didn't think I had standing water here. I don't understand why my leaves are brown. Okay. The reason is, is this is this is spider mite damage. Okay. The way to scout this into way is, is a pretty easy find. You can find it at 55 mile an hour, is that you'll see these field edges start to be infected first. So good and bad. Typically, by the time you will start to see spider mite damage, you're already to the extent in this photo. Okay, Spider mites have already gone out there. That soybean plant has had a bad day. Um, you know, We're trying to, to find um, the mites before we get to this level. However, we all know that sometimes this is pretty difficult. So uh, my suggestion, you know, guys in, in dry areas that have been hot, um, I'd like to see you guys out in the fields, you know, taking a look, trying to be preventative before we get to this uh, field margin level of, of injury symptoms. So a little bit, popping up in dry areas, they build extremely quickly towards the start of the field edges. If you, you see uh, an area of the field that looks somewhat like this in the middle of the field, chances are that's not spider mite. Okay, so we'll we need to look for something else. Um, typically, uh, when guys are trying to clean up the roadside or grass waterways, they'll mow. Um, it's really pretty for your fields, but unfortunately, you know, a little bit of uh, surface abrasion on those leaves, you know, that, that kind of stimulates uh, the spider mite damage. Okay, you might be thinking, okay, great, Stephanie's talking about insect uh, scouting. Spider mites are not insects, okay, they're mites. So the use of any type of insecticide is not going to help you. If anything, you might make your problems a little bit worse. You provide a little bit of carbohydrate for that mite to be able to feed on, a little bit of a sticky surface, typically not what we're looking for. So if you're out there with an insecticide, a pyrethroid, this is not what we want. Okay, It's a mite, very similar to maybe perhaps what your pet gets. It's a mite. We need to control them with a miticide. Okay, that, that's the only way that we can go about it. And typically when we think about insects or mites or scouting damage, you know, we always want to think about a threshold. Okay, again, typically, <laughs> unfortunately, when scouting, we'll get to a field that looks something like this, right? Okay, we know that that's already past threshold. So, you know, I would take preventative walks across our fields 
take a sheet of white paper and notebook, shake leaves, shake that plant and put that white piece of paper underneath of it. If you have mites, those mites will drop off of that plant and fall on that white piece of paper. Okay, Mites are typically on the bottom side. You can find webbing uh, that goes along with that. So, you know, trying to be preventative about spider mites, um, pretty important. Okay, so the whole idea is, you know, okay, great, I have mites, what do I do? Okay, typically when you get to this extent that you see here in the photo, um, best be out there making an application, okay? Um, trying to get to an economic threshold, we're already past it. So typically I'll receive the question saying, hey, I've got maybe 20 feet of damage around the perimeter of my fields. Do I need to spray the whole field with a miticide? So this is all a little bit environmentally responsive. Um, you know, and the other tool before I answer that is obviously we have undercover. Okay, this is going to get the bottom side of those leaves where those little buggers are hiding. Okay, trying to go after spider mites with undercover, probably about the best type of control mechanism that we have. So a field like this, can I just spray the borders? If I'm using undercover at this point in time, I'm going to say yes. Okay, you're down in that canopy, you're where those mites are at. Um, you know, for 20 feet in the field, I think that we can just spray those borders with um, undercover. If we get that damage migrating further into the field, if we're just using an over-the-top sprayer boom from the top down, um, we might want to go in the field a little bit further. But I think, you know, in terms of control with a product that we can offer growers for solutions with spider mites, boy, I'm real happy with the setup that we currently have um, with undercover. So spider mites are popping up. Got a, got a grower in Indiana, been working with here a little bit. Um, as we move further north where it's been hot, dry, um, mid-Michigan, uh, this might be a preventative, go look at your fields. Um, you know, they're, they're showing up. All right, let's move on to the next one. So I said we'd scout insects and we, I haven't talked about insect yet, so let's talk about an insect. Uh, second one that I've seen a lot of and uh, also heard um, folks to the west saying they're seeing a lot of are the Japanese beetle. Okay, Japanese beetle are going to affect both crops, corn and soybeans. If we're in a specialty crop, I'm sure they're after canola, um, more of your broadleaves. You know, what these insects are seeking out is moisture. Okay, so where you'll typically see damage, what we are automatically think of is that they will clip silks. Okay, they're clipping silk because they're going after moisture. It's hot, it's dry, they need moisture <laughs> to, to continue to live. So in corn, they'll clip our silks. In soybeans or any other broadleaf, they will defoliate. Okay, they're, they're trying to bring up moisture to sustain themselves. So, you know, what do we do? When do we de determine uh, treatment? So this is all very, you know, time dependent throughout the year and growth stage dependent. So here in, in Indiana, in Michigan, we're not quite too silk. We're not quite too pollination. But obviously the whole idea is that we want these um, silks to remain viable so that pollen grain can grow up through that silk and, and fertilize that ovule. So if Japanese beetles are clipping silks um, less than a half inch of length, you know, we're probably jeopardizing our pollination potential when it comes to corn. So, you know, the photo that you see there in your bottom right hand corner, this is not ideal. Um, this is when you definitely pull the trigger and you might be a little late. Um, when we think about soybeans, it's here on this next slide, when we think about percent defoliation, I think the textbooks are going to tell us somewhere around 20 to 25 percent. Okay? Um, textbooks will also tell you to go out, pull 25 leaflets, take a look at the chart, you know, take a good area of your field. If we're, if we're approaching that 20% uh, defoliation rate, this is probably when we need to be out in the field making making an application. You know, the whole idea, again, you know, Greg talks about a lot with corn, same as soybeans. We don't want these soybean plants to have a bad day. However, you know, you, you take a look at this 5% defoliation, you know, this is fine. Um, you'll see a little bit of defoliation. That soybean plant is going to be fine. But when we get up here to a quarter percent defoliation, 
we know that we're losing our um, photosynthetic capability and, and we really need to be out there. So again, you know, getting to the point in this bottom right hand corner of, of silk clipping, in my perspective, this is probably the worst damage a Japanese beetle can do. Okay? We're jeopardizing pollination. Okay? If we don't pollinate, we don't have a kernel. If we don't have a kernel, it doesn't go in the grain tank, we don't make money. So, you know, really be out there scouting your cornfields if we're, you know, just starting to throw silks. Um, best make sure, you know, our thresholds are either A, not there, or B, low enough before we need to make an application because Japanese beetles, this, this silk clipping is, is severely uh, impactful towards yield potential. Soybeans, it looks bad. It is yield potentially robbing, but maybe not quite as bad as this silk clipping. Um, again, that chat window, guys, feel free to ask your questions. Maybe I'm doing a superb job of answering all of them before you can ask them, but feel free to put, a, put them in that chat box. Okay, next one, western bean cutworm. There are many reports to the west that a lot of agronomists are catching these in their pheromone traps. So just want to talk a little bit about this insect, what we could and what we should do about it. Okay, we're starting to see moths now. We actually, I actually saw a few reports even in June of folks catching the western bean cutworm. Okay, they will uh, uh, appear corn and late in the world stage uh, because they're, they're laying eggs at that point in time. And the way that you can differentiate um, this moth other, in comparison to others is one, you've got this small white circle. Typically it's darker. When we think about earworm, earworm is, is typically a, a beige type of moth. So a little bit different for you. Uh, you've got this thick whitish stripe at the front of the forewing, and you've got this kidney bean comma shape. Okay. Um, if you've got multiple moths in your trap, um, you've got a couple different pheromones there. Um, being able to pick up western bean cutworm is is pretty easy if you've got them to compare to. That that earworm, uh, which the western states are beginning to see, is is pretty beige in color. Okay. So here's what this freshly laid egg mass looks like. Uh, these eggs will change color um, as they progress. So they can either be purple or white. But what you will find is that they'll be in that quarter, you know, take a quarter in comparison to size. They'll be in that quarter size um, egg mass uh, laid typically on the underside of the leaf. So uh, I guess this photo is comparing it to a piece of of, of pollen to give you a size perspective. Okay, this is you know where we are looking to control in terms of you know when we can make an economic decision where we're not losing yield potential. We want to get out there and control those moths. We want to control these eggs before they hatch. Okay, once we get to the worm stage, um, it, it can be difficult to control. So let's talk about that. Uh, typically. Uh, when growers will know that western bean cutworm is an issue is when we start to see this ear feeding. Okay, Once we get into that ear, um, we've kind of already created ourselves some problems. Okay, So many growers will be out there pulling husk back and they'll see a worm. Okay, It could be three potential worms. It could be the army worm, ear worm, or western bean cutworm. Okay? Here we've already lost yield protect, uh, potential uh, to give you an idea. Many of our traded corn products will be able to control against western bean cutworm with that cry one F protein. Um, so you know what do we do? You know timing in terms of control are, are very very important. Um, when we look at an earworm, okay, you peel that husk back, you see multiple worms. Typically, okay, um, it, you, you're agronomist, you can always say it depends. Typically, you will not see a couple earworms on an ear of corn. Um, earworm, uh, you know, they'll cannibalize each other. Typically, you'll see one to be very large. It's, it's pretty aggressive towards other earworms. With western bean cutworm, you can see multiple western bean cutworms per ear. Okay, uh, in comparison, here you can see that it's a little bit darker gray. In terms of color, an army worm will put, look pretty greasy. Uh, this western bean cutworm can look a little bit greasy uh, to differentiate the two, uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea on, on differentiating between worms. Um, 
you know, when we're down in that canopy, we're down on that ear, on the underside of those leaves, you know, again, being able to use undercover in a situation like this to get full plant coverage to control against western bean cutworm if you have an untreated hybrid, pretty much the best way to do it, guys. Um, can you control it top down? Absolutely. But here, you know, we kind of take away the guesswork of, hey, have we targeted uh, the bottom side of the leaf? Have we targeted the tip of the ear where this insect typically will move through? Um, if you see one out in your fields, you know, we, again, always want to talk about this economic threshold, right? Um, you know, if you see one, you probably don't need to pull the trigger. Um, examine a few plants out there, guys. Get at least 10. See how many, how many worms you have out there. It's a little late, but if we can scout for that egg mass, um, if we can watch for moth flights, uh, this is probably best. So the next insect, the last insect I'll talk about today is this red-headed flea beetle. So I'll be honest, I have not seen this out um, in northern Indiana fields, moving farther north and farther east. But I know that Jim's seen quite a few of these in his, you know, central or southern uh, Indiana area. Okay, so similar to a Japanese beetle in soybeans, uh, another defoliant. Okay, it's going to look to to take away our leaf surface area, reduce our our photosynthetic capability. Okay, so for again, when we look at defoliants in soybeans, if we're at that 20 to 25 percent um, defoliation rate, you know, this is when we really need to start think about pulling the trigger uh, to make an application. Again, as with all insects, when we get into hot, dry periods, okay, typically they're not looking to get a suntan, so they're not going to be on top of that leaf. They're going to be on the bottom side of leaves. So really getting out there, um, you know, when we think about scouting for Japanese beetles, for this flea beetle, we can use those insect nets to take a look. Um, you know, typically you can kind of look for these puncture wounds, these defoliation wounds across that leaf surface. Um, but, but try to be a little bit preventative about that. You know, systematically walk across a field either in a zigzag pattern to make sure that we're hitting multiple soil types and in microenvironments. You know, make sure we're being preventative because obviously once we get these holes that you can see here in this leaf, you know, you can't bring those back. So being preventative about these scouting walks, scouting passes, very, very important. Okay, obviously typically with um, with these type of beetles, if you have a garden, you have roses, this is going to be the canary in the coal mine. Okay, they're, they're, they're typically going to target these uh, just because they, they can get a little bit more, um, more water, more moisture when they go to consume, consume that leaf. Okay, here you can see um, there's a beetle on the leaf, it, it'll hop. Okay, don't get confused with the leaf hopper um, in, in that canopy. Um, but again, you'll see the, you know, the, the BB effect on these leaves, that defoliation um, across that leaf. All right, let's talk a little bit more about uh, sw sw swishing roles here. Let's talk about diseases. So, you know, in my region of the world in comparison, 2015 diseases versus 2016 diseases. So every disease you focused on last year, an extremely cool, wet growing season, Okay, that's switch thoughts. Okay, you're, you're, you're typically not going to see those same type of diseases crop up in a dry, um, hot year. But I also know that a lot of the region, a lot of the U.S. isn't exactly as dry and as hot as perhaps this one. So what I really want to touch on today, northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, and common rust appearing in a few areas. Okay, so northern corn leaf blight. We saw this disease spread like wildfire last year, okay? It's typically aided by cool, wet conditions, okay? You know, textbook will tell you, actually, northern corn leaf blight will come up from a ground up within that plant, but if you're out there scouting fields, you know, I'm typically, when I scout, I'm going to look at those top leaves because typically this will blow in from other fields it will blow in with wind currents, okay? So textbook, yes, it starts the ground up, but typically you're going to see, you know, these lesions. Let me bring out my pointer here. 
these cigar shaped lesions in that upper canopy. Okay, so th these are large, you know, if you hear any agronomists talk about them, they always call them cigar shaped. Um, they will follow the vein of that plant, but obviously be a little bit wider than just one vein. So let's take a little bit closer look here. So scouting, scouting northern corn leaf blight. It's got multiple areas, just like with any other disease or insect. Um, you know, with mainly corn diseases, scout your continuous corn or your no-till fields first where you have a lot more residue. You know, your corn to soybean rotation, you don't have so much residue out in the field. So typically when you think about a pathogen, you know, of course we need that disease triangle, right? You need the pathogen host environment. But here, when we take a look and, and target our environment, um, that more, you know, Continuous corn, no-till fields, we have more residue. That's, that's the environment most of these like. Okay. Um, when you're working with growers, there are hybrids that are very, very susceptible to northern corn leaf blight, and there's other hybrids that are not. Okay. It, probably historically, um, you know some brands, you know some hybrids uh, that are more susceptible to northern corn leaf blight. You know, go scout those fields first. Um, you know, be a little smart. Tar target your worst fields. Again, that canary in the coal mine, go out, take a look, see what you're seeing. Um, you know, folks that didn't scout last year, northern corn leaf blight took an extremely dark green, great growing field and basically killed it in a week and a half to two weeks. You know, it, it all desic you know, it turned brown. So this is something we really need to be on top of when we come into our scouting passes. Okay, headline amp works pretty darn well. Um, there are other options out there, you know, depending on what brand uh, you use. So when I get questions about these diseases, it can get a little confusing because there's, there's several diseases that look very, very similar to, to northern corn leaf blight. So if you took a look at that first picture here, you can see northern corn leaf blight, right? That same shape, that same cigar shape, okay? On the contrary, okay, up here in the photo, we've got northern corn leaf blight, we've got heat stress, Stewart's wilt, and Goss's wilt, okay? Take a look at this picture up here, okay? You can see some differences. You can see freckling within this leaf. You don't see freckling down here um, on this northern corn leaf blight. Here as well, if you take a look at the margins of this lesion, you can kind of see it, it spreading or, or leaking or water staining, okay? This disease up here is Goss's wilt, okay? Guys to the west, um, you know, Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, Oklahoma, you know, Goss's wilt has become a, a severe disease here over the past five, six years for you folks. So Goss's wilt will typically come in with some type of abrasion to that leaf, okay? Whether, you know, sandblasting, you know, we get a little bit of lodging in that field to get a little bit of damage. This is Goss's will, okay? You can see the difference. Down here in northern corn leaf blight, you kind of have that solid edge. You don't see freckling within that lesion. Here, you kind of see that bleeding or water staining around the edge of that margin, and of course, you can see the freckles, okay? And then let's compare it to another one, okay? This over here, you have a little bit of a solid edge, right? But the difference Okay, take, again, take a look here at northern corn leaf blight in comparison to this. Here, you can see black little dots. Okay, those black dots are pycnidia. Okay, over here in northern corn leaf blight, you won't see that. Okay, this disease over here is not northern corn leaf blight. Even though it, it has a solid margin, it has that cigar shape, um, this is diplodia leaf streak. Okay, the difference is northern corn leaf blight to diplodia is this pycnidia. Okay, you got to take a quick look at that. As we move farther north and farther east, okay, Stewart's wilt got its name in Michigan, okay? What happens here is that beetles will create a little bit of an of a entry wound for this disease to come in, and it'll be a solid streak, as you can see here in this photo, down the leaf, okay? Again, comparison to northern corn leaf blight, more cigar-shaped. Stewart's wilt, more of a streak across that leaf. And then unfortunately, what we're seeing a lot in dry areas this year is this heat stress. 
Okay, those stomates are trying to protect that leaf, trying to protect the moisture within that leaf and control cellular respiration. Here from the rolling and unrolling of that leaf, you can see, you know, this brown necrotic tissue. Okay, obviously, again, northern corn leaf bite, cigar shaped here. You don't really have a pattern to how that disease works. Okay, so you're saying, okay, that's great. <laughs> I'm not going to be on jeopardy. I don't care. Here's why it's truly impactful. When we think about management, folks, okay, fungicide, we think, yeah, we've got a, we've got a leaf disease. What is fungicide going to control? Okay, fungicide is only going to control this northern corn leaf blight. Okay, not going to control, you know, diplodia happens so, um, you know, it, it can happen any time throughout the year. There's really no pattern for it. So being able to scout and make a fungicide pass for diplodia, leaf streak, really, really hard. Goss's wilt, a fungicide will not have any activity on it. This is really hybrid based. So if you're in an area known for Goss's wilt, make sure that we are choosing hybrids that are not susceptible. Stewart's wilt, like I said, is typically an insect, a beetle type of disease. And once it's in there, um, you know, we already have that infection wound. We're not going to control it. And obviously a fungicide, you know, this is, this is gone. It's not going to spread its heat stress. So when we're scouting fields with all of these lookalikes, northern corn leaf blight um, is the one where fungicide is truly going to be impactful. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on here to the next one. The next leaf disease that a fungicide is truly going to be impactful is this gray leaf spot and common rust. Okay, gray leaf spot, as folks in, in high moisture areas with a lot of residue know that this is a bottom up disease. Okay. Gray leaf spot is going to splatter up out of that residue where the infection lies and move, move up in that plant. So when you're out there scouting fields, you know, when I worked out in Illinois, guys, you're always going to find some sort of gray leaf spot at some point in the season. You know, trying to find that economic threshold, uh, where, really where we need to be. As always with any other scouting pass, start with, you know, the hybrids that are susceptible. Start in areas with a lot of residue, whether it's, you know, continuous corn, whether it's no-till. Um, you know, we might be a little bit too hot, <laughs> if possible, for gray leaf spot, but, you know, even though it says 70 degree to 80 degrees, it's going to be out there, okay? So look at that, look at that bottom canopy first as we progress. Okay, here's some thresholds for you. And, you know, trying to figure out that economic threshold for you might be different, perhaps, than what the university will tell you. So 50% um, is, is kind of the academic approach to threshold. Um, you know, from my experience, I would say if you have a susceptible hybrid, if you're at 25%, if, we're, if we have moisture out in that field, we know we have our temperature, um, anywhere north of 25% damage, guys, is where I'm going to think about pulling the threshold. You know, just as we've always talked about with fungicides, it's two-sided. One, we're trying to control the disease. Two, you know, this stay green, okay? Typically, you know, most folks on this call are, uh, are wanting to go after higher yields, typically thinking about managing more of our nitrogen later into the season. If we're managing nitrogen, you know, mid to late season, I want that full green, healthy plant growing. So, you know, going after high yields, um, you know, 25 and north. Obviously, we all get to play this game of sharpening our pencils as, as sharp as possible when we pencil in our corn price. Um, you know, I'm in the camp of thinking, you know, you can't sell it if you don't have it. Um, so, you know, the markets with the instability that we currently have, you're trying to pencil $3 corn. I know a lot of us have, you know, tried to do some type of marketing plan and sold it for $4 corn. Um, we get close to that 25, 30% threshold on gray leaf spot. I still feel pretty comfortable about pulling that trigger from a disease standpoint. And then, of course, we're still trying to keep it green. Let's, uh, let's continue this agronomic conversation, but let's talk about 360 bullet, okay? Tillage, okay? 
I will be first, foremost, and upfront. I am not encouraging tillage if you are not in a tillage system. What I am encouraging is that if you do perform tillage, that we do it as well as possible. Now, the whole idea of tillage is that we're eliminating compaction. Okay, we're not out there um, to create more compaction, right? So tillage, typically. We're running our implement across the ground. We see a level soil surface. We see breaking. We see this uh, residue start to be sized. We see, you know, pretty good breakup of that soil uh, particle. We're pretty happy, right? This is tillage. A lot of guys are going to see this, but you know, when we think about a ripper, okay, we've got a, a gang of disc or two, whether they're serrated or not, on the front. That those disc are meant to size the residue and work that into those top two, three inches. And what we're really worried about here is this washboarding effect, right? You know, where do those ripper points go through? You know, are we making all of our soil fertility available to the plant? And are we increasing our water infiltration rate throughout that soil profile? So when we think about tillage, it's twofold, right? One, residue, typically working those first couple inches, getting good residue to soil contact, increase microbial activity, and then we got to think about this washboard that's underneath. Okay, I went to my old grad school books to try to dig this out. So, okay, let me go back here. Typically as growers, we're really, really able to see physical um, implications when we perform an agronomic task. It's easy to see that, hey, we pulled this ripper across, We've sized this residue, we worked the first couple inches, and a lot of folks aren't aware of this, but that's easy to see. But we really got to think about, you know, again, twofold. One, physical. Two, what can that plant pull up in terms of fertility? All right, when we talk about nitrogen, let me get my highlighter here. We talk about nitrogen, right? Okay, we know that nitrogen, 99% of the total N needed by that plant comes up through mass flow. Okay, that means it gets into water that corn root system pulls it up into the plant by water. Okay, this is a mobile nutrient. Similarly, when we look at sulfur, okay, 99% of nitrogen, 94% of sulfur comes up into that plant via mass flow with water. Mobile nutrients in the soil. What we really have to be concerned about are these immobile nutrients in the soil. Okay, diffusion and root interception. That that root physically has to grow to these nutrients to get up into that plant. So when we think about uh, phosphorus, right? We have dissolved phosphorus and we have our, our static phosphorus, which we normally immobile phosphorus that we think about. You know, folks around Lake Erie, you guys are very familiar with dissolved phosphorus. That dissolved phosphorus is what's getting into the lake. But when we think about our immobile phosphorus, you know, this is what's in mobile. We need that root system to grow to that phosphorus. Similarly, in the soil, we think about uh, potassium. Okay, those roots have to grow to it. And then we got to think about our zinc, our iron, some of our more, um, our, our micronutrients, which we can typically see uh, signs of um, being deficient. You know, the question becomes, you know, one, is it truly in the soil? Or two, are we just not making that available to our plant? Okay, when we go back and we think about that washboard, right? Let me go back here. Or, yeah, let's go forward. We think about that full root system. Okay, here we don't have any physical limitations to how that root is growing through that profile. I feel confident if there's phosphorus, potassium out here, if there's iron out here, this plant is able to get a hold of it, pull it up into the plant because those roots are 100%, you know, non-restricted, mining that whole soil profile. But when we think about these washboards, right, guys, we got to think, you know, do we have a physical limitation to that root growing throughout? Okay, uh, in my area, there's a lot of manganese um, deficiencies. We take a look at manganese, you know, typically this will work through a little mass flow, but we know um, that we get a little bit through root interception. You know, are we setting ourselves up for a limitation just because we've worked our ground differently? 
Okay. Um, I've got it on another side, but take a look at this washboard, right? You can see that surface smearing. Okay, here we have a high gradient of of soil density, right? Because you know that ripper point. Let me go back here. That ripper point is forcing more um, more compaction, more more taking away the oxygen in that soil profile. So you see that smearing when we get that washboarding. Okay, so that, that's remember that as we move forward here. So bullet, um, if you paid attention to any of our uh, marketing or any of our conference calls to this point. Uh, you'll notice a ripper point will pretty much fit just about any ripper out there. If we don't today, uh, we're making strides to fit it as we continue. But this point is 14 inches across. Okay, Very different than maybe some of our case, our deer, and maybe some more of our no low disturbance type of rippers. Okay, We're wanting to explode that washboard. We want you know, our roots to not have a physical barrier and then when we think about let me move back here a couple when we think about water infiltration across this area you know water is uniformly hitting the soil surface but how does water act when it hits this physical barrier right are we getting more ponding are we getting more nitrogen uh, denitrification because that water is staying there longer because it's hitting that that physical barrier, you know, these are all questions uh, we need to think about, okay? So obviously this is what we're after. That's that's full profile shatter. So I'm on a 30 inch spacing uh, at home uh, to what I tested on. A lot of you folks are at a 20 inch spacing. On my 30 inch spacing, you can kind of see the, the very point of that bullet go through. And on a 30 inch spacing, I saw maybe a two inch berm in between these, but I definitely did not see this washboarding. Okay, this washboarding we used a little bit of a uh, more of a laser point. It was an aftermarket um, for a more uh, conservative till, if you will. Uh, but definitely saw just that point line go through, and here with the bullet in those heavy clays, compacted areas, we saw that full soil uh, shatter. Okay, here you can see, you know, got a lot of questions on, isn't this going to create smear? Isn't this just creating another layer of compaction? So here's, here's the photos, right? Okay, we don't see that layer of compaction. Um, we will continue um, to see that as we progress here. So there's a side-by-side. -side. Again, you can see that washboarding effect versus the non-bullet. Again, think of your physical barrier of water holding that longer than maybe what we want. To that physical barrier of root growth when we think of mining that soil profile for all nutrients. Okay, so for instance, on our home farm, um, we've got a five point ripper, we've got 235 horses. Um, I went ahead and you know put the bullet on there last fall, and I, I, you know, I just thought there was no way with 235 horses, we were already at the top of our horsepower limit with a five point ripper. Um, I just thought, you know, there's just no way, right? So as, you know, if you've listened to any of our presentations so far, you'll see here that our average pass time, so going same length with, you know, that narrower point versus our 14-inch point, uh, very, very similar, um, running about the same speed. You know, what I would say for a talking point is if someone asks you if it's going to pull harder, um, on all of our data, so obviously we get into more abrasive soils, our sands up there in southwest Michigan, for example, our, our gravels that we saw in Ontario. Um, you know, I would say zero to five percent more horsepower would be needed, which would then, you know, zero to five percent change on our time. Um, it's very, very, very similar. And the reasons why we only see that zero to five percent, even though we're at 14 inches, is that of all of these key characteristics, you know, the, the pitch, the angle of these wings, truly, truly important. Um, when I talk to growers, I liken it to a tile plow. It's more of a lift in shatter instead of a one of those laser points, which is a little bit more like a snow plow when we go across our soil profile. So it's a lift and shatter. That's why we're not seeing um, that additional horsepower and fuel consumption needs, even though we're shattering the entire profile. Okay, again, you know, 
number one question I get asked, won't this produce a smear? And I know that you guys, if you if you listen to Greg there uh, a few weeks ago, you know, liking it to, you know, this bucket of our of our skid steer, right? You know, if if you're landscaping and you want to create a big smear, you level that bucket, all right? So you know, once it's leveled, that's going to create smear. Once you look at this side by side of how our point mounts on that shank. Here you can see that we're not level. We're pointing the very tip of that ripper a little bit deeper than the rest. We're hollow underneath. We're not having a solid line of iron in that soil profile that would create that smear like you would get with a level bucket out in um, you know, a landscaping scenario. So no, it doesn't create smear. I think that we focus a lot on the horsepower, speed, and pulling. Uh, the question of where, how long do they last? You know, similarly, when you answer that chain roll question, right? Very similar to OEM. Obviously, soil uh, conditions are going to impact that. If you're in more of an abrasive soil, sand, you know, your OEM point's going to wear out, and so is bullet. Okay, we beef this up um, with that cap. Okay, you know, having that cast and fabricated hybrid has really be, you know, versus our testing has increased our longevity of the point. Um, it's a really robust design, um, you know, hitting rocks. We all saw the video of, um, of R&D running it into concrete barriers, it holding up. Feel really confident about where. You know, again, it's twofold, physical and fertility in water, okay? We're eliminating that washboard, okay? No other, you know, point out there is truly doing that. What that's going to affect, you know, Matt tells the story of a sprayer going across the field and feeling a little bit of rocking back and forth. That's going up and over the berm of that old ripper point and falling down into where that ripper pass fell. Okay, here is a lot better performance. You know, that sprayer is going to hold rock solid uh, in that track. Your planter is not going to be up and over all those berms all the time because you're having a soil gradient difference as well. Okay, soil fracture. Um, you know, we're getting better root penetration, we're getting more air and water, you know, better water infiltration down in that profile, you know, we're alleviating that compaction. So for you folks that have had a lot of water this year, Missouri, right? So you've had a ton of water, you know, do we have a compaction layer down there beneath those ripper points? Um, or even in between, you know, the 20 inch or 30 inch ripper points. You know, being able to move that water through the profile, you know, similarly with tile, right? We want to get it, we want water, but we also don't want it to sit there forever. We want that to move through our soil profile. So um, that would be impactful. You know, unlock the nutrients in the berm. You know, those nutrients we need through um, root interception and diffusion, those are the ones that we're after. Um, you know, unlocking that P, the K, the iron, um, the zinc, you know, what we typically see deficiencies of, uh, something that we can truly go after uh, with the bullet. So um, got a question here talking about rust. I said I would talk about it in uh, the disease insect standpoint and I never did. So when we think about rust, okay, we've got many types of rust out there. We've got common, we've got southern. Um, you see rust on the top of the leaf and on the bottom of the leaf, typically up towards the top of the leaf. Um, rust, you know, there's always the wives tail and I've got um, irrigation within my areas that if you have irrigation you'll never see rust. Uh, two years ago I saw rust in irrigated fields. So typically, you know, you're hot, you're dry, that rust is going to move in through storm patterns, um, moving in uh, with our wind currents. Again, something to monitor out there. You know, last year probably would have never had to think about rust, but a little bit drier, a little bit hotter year, um, we think about monitoring for rust. You know, is rust going to rob us of as much yield potential as per se northern corn leaf blight? Probably not. Rust is, you know, I won't always say cosmetic, but um, the chance of that reducing yield potential is lower than versus a gray leaf spot or northern corn leaf blight, but definitely needs to be out there. You know, if, again, if we're getting a disease over a quarter of that leaf surface, you know, and it's spreading, that's when we need to get out there and pull the trigger. Bottom line, 
since it's dry, okay, we're one to, you know, when it's, when it's dry, Missouri, I know you're not dry. <laughs> Northern Illinois, I know you're not dry. You know, in these types of situations, in this type of hot year, uh, typically a little bit drier for some, we need to be preventative about some of these scouting passes, okay? We're, we're trying to conserve as much moisture here through the pollination window and early grain fill, whereas if, if we get um, any of these diseases and start pulling out moisture from that crop, uh, we're, we're truly going to be impacted by that. So, you know, just like uh, as, as many agronomists will say, you know, uh, a fungicide insecticide won't make you more yield. Obviously, they're yield protection products. So the best way to yield protect is to be out there and on top of it with scouting. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Have a great day and stay safe, everyone.